We are live. Good evening, all. Welcome to iFocus Online, the three seventy first episode, forty six in the oculoplasty module. Today we have with us Dr. Seema Das from Shroff Charitable Eye Hospital, Delhi, to speak to us on the less common yet important osseous and fibrosseous tumors of the orbit. Dr. Seema Das completed her basic medical education from the prestigious Lady Harding Medical College, New Delhi, and her postgraduate training in ophthalmology from Maulana Azad Medical College. She has a clinical fellowship in ophthalmic plastic surgery, orbit, ocular oncology from the prestigious L.V. Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad, and is in charge of the ophthalmic plastic surgery, orbit, and ocular oncology services at Shroff Charitable Eye Hospital. She also heads the medical education department at the same. Her areas of interest include ophthalmic plastic surgery, ocular and adnexal tumors, specifically retinoblastoma, orbital diseases, and reconstructive oculofacial surgery and ophthalmic medical education. Over to you, ma'am, for tonight's lecture. Thank you, Shibha, for that introduction. Um, as you mentioned, this probably uh, you know the fibrosseous lesions are probably the you know the le less commonly seen lesions of the orbit. But nevertheless, they are important, you know, uh, at least from a residency. Just a second. For the residents, at least it's important to know the basic theory aspect of it. And uh, also from the point of view of uh, you know, managing some of those cases, we, we do see some of them once in a while. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so Important to know is common and the important ones uh, which you might might be uh, encountering once in a while. So it's a very vast list if we talk about the orbital uh, bony and the cartilaginous tumors. So for the sake of uh, simplifying the talk and just to keep it more practical and relevant, I'll focus on the more important ones, some of the benign and uh, the malignant ones that we commonly encounter. And uh, we try to keep it as practical as possible. Uh, while talking about primary bony tumors, uh, tumors of the bone, uh, many of them are primarily from the bone. But uh, if we see patients in our practice, what we see are more of secondary lesions. Means the tumors which might not be arising from the bone, but do they do cause some amount of changes in the bone, uh, which sometimes can uh, be in the form of uh, compression, lysis, erosion, destruction of the bone, or just changes because of the uh, mass effect of the lesion. So th these are the more important categories of the lesions. I will just quickly go through some of those uh, lesions just to illustrate the various bone changes that we might see and then go down to some of the uh, common primary bone tumors. Now before we even go into that, uh, whenever um, we deal with bony tumors, this is one of the mnemonics I found uh, from one of the YouTube presentations uh, which has been prepared by an orthopedic group. Uh, this is a small mnemonic, a simple one, uh, which might give us an idea how to approach this patient whenever we face uh, somebody where we feel that the lesion could be primarily in the bone. Uh, because all of these categories, all of these pointers or parameters are going to tell us uh, or let us uh, sort of, you know, uh, help us in making a differential diagnosis of those lesions. So age is an important parameter because there are different lesions which, which can be there in the different age groups. We'll come into the details of it as we talk about the cases. Uh, the site is important, uh, might not be very relevant for the orbit, but when you talk about other bony lesions, especially the long bone tumors, uh, the site is important because there are tumors which arise specifically from the metaphysis or the diaphysis or epiphysis of the bone. And the size is also equally important as we'll be seeing in some of the orbital lesions. The pattern of destruction, this is very, very important because most of the differential diagnosis of the bone tumors, which are essentially uh, radiological, are based on the pattern of uh, destruction of the bone or uh, other changes within the bone itself. The margins and the transition zones are also important. That will help us in differentiating some of the benign lesions from the malignant ones. Uh, the pattern of the matrix uh, whether it's more of a predominantly uh, fibrous component or an osteoid component is again going to help give us some clue because ultimately it uh, it is what decides the radiological appearance of the lesion. The response to the cortex, um, uh, cortical, uh, I mean to say the, you know, the cortex of the bone, how does it respond to the lesion within? Uh, 
that there is any destruction or just a simply erosion or expansion is again uh, going to give us some clue to arrive at a differential. Uh, response of the periodic stem is again important uh, as well as involvement of the surrounding soft tissue. So I think it's a simple mnemonic. It's important to remember it whenever we are evaluating any patient with bone tumors. I found it pretty useful. So just wanted to share. Uh, now, going into some of the basic terminologies that we often use in our practice, like when we talk about bony changes on imaging, we talk about lysis and sclerosis, which are basically uh, a way of saying how does the bone look like on the imaging. Um, so, lytic lesions are generally radiolucent. Sclerosis is more of a radiodense appearance. Uh, lysis and erosion, again, are uh, again sometimes the terms which are used interchangeably. Lysis probably is a more generalized sort of term, more extensive sort of uh, damage to the bone, whereas erosion in, means more localized, uh, more subtle or more or less aggressive uh, destruction of the bone. But eventually, both the terms does mean destruction of the bone to some extent. <clears throat> Excavation is something uh, uh, a step beyond the erosion possibly, where there is a more deeper um, or a more concave appearance of the lesion within the bone. And many times this is also used when we talk about uh, kind of, you know, to denote the mass effect of any long-standing benign lesion also. Uh, so there might not be destruction of the bone per se, but there might be some effect where one of the table of the bones is getting compressed because of a long-standing mass effect, uh, giving rise to a appearance of almost an excavation of uh, when we talk about the matrix pattern, the mineralization pattern of the matrix, which are essentially histopathological findings, but this does boil down to the radiological appearance of the bone. And based on what is the predominant mineralization pattern, whether it's more of a fibrous component, uh, and if this is so on histopath, the radiological appearance corresponds to what we call as a ground glass appearance. So all of us understand what is a ground glass. This is basically a glass which has been grinded down to become more opaque. And we do see those glasses being used sometime uh, in windows and doors and many other areas. Uh, we will delve a little deeper into it when we talk about the specific tumor which shows this appearance on imaging. Uh, and this is how it looks like basically, a more translucent appearance or diffuse translucent appearance of the bony lesion. If there is a predominant of osteoid component, if the mineralization pattern is like that on histopath, uh, what we see on the imaging is more dense looking areas within the bony lesion, uh, forming something like what we call as a cumulus cloud kind of pattern. Whereas if it is more of chondroid component within the lesion, uh, the appearance can be something like you know popcorn or arcs or rings of um, hyperdense areas on imaging. So these are like specific terms which might be used in the context of specific tumors. Doesn't mean that you know um, this uh, sort of findings are restricted to any particular uh, lesion. There can be lesions where there is a mixture of all these uh, sort of uh, findings uh, based on what are the changes which are going on within the tumor. But by and large, just to have a broader idea, it's important to remember this terminology. Also important to know is the reaction of the periosteum to any lesion within the bone. And uh, we do see some of those lesions when we uh, review the imaging a CT scan of a bony tumor. Uh, in fact, if you, if you see, this is again something uh, which I got from one of the articles, the different pattern of periosteal reaction. Many of them might not be relevant for us, uh, but there are some like, for example, the sunburst pattern, um, like where you see that like almost like rays of sun which are uh, coming from the main lesion within the bone, which are basically the periosteum reaction in a linear pattern, uh, which sometimes are seen in specific kind of tumors like osteosarcoma or even Ewing sarcoma. Corman's triangle is a, again a very specific finding, might not be very relevant for us, usually uh, relevant in the context of long bone setting, uh, long bone tumors. Onion skin or a concentric sort of uh, appearance of the lesion of the periosteal reaction is again something which is more relevant in the setting of the uh, long bone tumors, but a few lesions of the orbit can also have this kind of pattern. We'll talk about it later. More important for us might be something like an axial pattern where there is an expansion of the uh, outer cortex and corresponding reaction or of the periosteum to, to cause a thin radiodense margin of the lesion, uh, which sometimes is referred to as the axial pattern on the image. So might be a good idea to at least remember some of those terminologies even from the exam point of view. <clears throat> 
Now, moving on to some of the um, other lesions, the non-primary bone lesions, which can have associated bony changes. Uh, just to get an idea about what are the different kind of things which we look at, see in the bone whenever we talk about any uh, tumor or tumor-like lesions. Now, this was a child. We can see that this child had recurrent bouts of inflammation centered around the lateral canthus. He does have a small fistula here above the eyebrow. And this is what his imaging is showing. And if we see carefully, he has some amount of sclerosis or thickening of the bone, as we can see here. And there seems to be a soft tissue lesion, which is centered, uh, which is seems to be around the lateral orbit, superolateral orbit, as we see in the coronal and the axial sections here. Uh, but the lesion seems to be also extending into the bone and coming out seems to have a communication to the temporal fossa area also. So this corresponds to what we are seeing on the clinical finding also. And uh, all of us know this is probably an intraosseous dermoid that we are talking about. And many of them uh, can arise from inside the bone or can have extension within the bone. And since these are lesions which incites lots of, lot of inflammation, uh, generally, you see a lot of uh, reactive changes of the bone, surrounding bone, in the form of thickened periosteum uh, and sclerosis of the bone. And uh, correspondingly, uh, the intraoperative findings uh, does correspond to what we see clinically as well as on the imaging. So this is the small area with the bone with an erosion of the, uh, with a small track which is formed within the bone. And you can see this track uh, when we open it up, when we derope the bone, and that is visible, which is coming out through the skin, corresponding to the area of the fistula here. So that's one thing. These are not primary bone tumors, but these are the tumors of, uh, or tumor-like lesions, which can have associated bony changes, which we should be aware of. Meningioma, another very common tumor. In fact, the bony changes are quite pathognomic of these lesions, uh, so much so that uh, the imaging sometimes are almost diagnostic. Uh, like, for example, these uh, middle-aged women who comes with a slowly progressive proptosis with some amount of displacement of the globe and some visual disturbance. And if we see a lesion like this, which looks like a predominantly soft tissue lesion, which seems to be centered on the lateral wall of the orbit, the triradiate area that we generally call, where there are three compartments merging together, the orbit, the intracranial cavity, as well as the temporal fossa. So other than the soft tissue component, what is pathognomic is the reaction, bony um, hyperostosis, which is uh, quite pathognomic of these uh, meningioma lesions, the sphenoid wing meningiomas, and uh, the radiological findings are pretty diagnostic of these kind of lesions. So there are very few lesions where we see sclerosis or thickening of the bone uh, when we talk about uh, tumors. Most of the tumors will cause some amount of lysis or destruction of the bone, but this is one tumor where there is sclerosis of the bone. Uh, some of the metastasis lesions like coming from the breast also sometimes can be osteoblastic rather than osteolytic and can cause thickening of the bone rather than erosion of the bone. Another tumor of childhood, uh, a wing sarcoma as well as PNET, primitive neuroectodermal tumor, uh, they seem to be primarily based on the bone with a lot of soft tissue component, though they are mesenchymal tumors, but there are extensive bony changes. And sometimes these are pretty striking, like the sunburst appearance that we see in the peanut or sometimes in Ewing sarcoma can sometimes give us a clue to the diagnosis. Plasma cytoma, again, another tumor which can be centered on the bone, but this is one lesion which will cause lysis of the bone rather than uh, uh, bony sclerosis. And again, the soft tissue component is the predominant lesion, uh, which helps us in getting uh, to the diagnosis. Uh, it's not only tumors, sometimes the infective lesions like uh, chronic in infections of the orbit, granulomatous infections like tuberculosis can also cause changes of the bone uh, because of the associated infection of the bone in the form of osteomyelitis. And what we see here could be some amount of sclerosis as these are long-standing inflammations. And simultaneously, there is erosion as well as excavation of the bone. And if we see the first uh, coronal section here, there is some um, changes of the osteomyelitis in the form of a sequestrum, which seems to be there in the area. So again, these are changes which can be there even in non-tumorous lesions and which are important to remember and know. Now, coming on to the primary uh, tumors of the bone. Uh, so the benign tumors, mostly the osteomyelitis, uh, and then there are the developmental anomalies in the form of fibrous dysplasias. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about osteo uh, ossifying fibroma and then a little bit about um, 
malignant tumor that is osteogenic sarcoma. I think these are the uh, four or five important ones that we see there. There is an extensive list of other lesions like osteoblastomas, osteoplastomas, um, giant cell tumors, but most of them we rarely get to see in and around the orbit. And many a times the diagnosis of these lesions mainly remain uh, histopathological uh, and the radiological appearance sometimes can be quite overlapping. So coming on to the osteomas, which probably is the most common primary bony lesion, it's a benign tumor, um, usually arising from um, some of the orbital bones. The frontal sinus area is more commonly affected. We can have osteomas arising from the uh, bones around the ethmoid sinus also. And if the lesion or if the, uh, you know, the tumor is arising from the uh, bone around the spinoid sinus, then sometimes it can cause uh, some tension of the optic nerve near the orbital apex. And uh, generally, they're very, very slow growing in young adults mostly, and mostly solitary lesions. And uh, uh, most of the time, the symptom will depend on the location of the tumor and the growth rate. So if it is something which is extremely small and uh, not growing very fast, most of the time we will just detect, it could be in just an incidental finding for imaging done for other um, indications. But if it is something which is big enough, located at an area which is causing pressure effect on the surrounding structures, it can cause symptoms. Uh, like for example, if it obstructing the ostium of the sinuses, then there can be a chronic sinusitis, mucosal formation, secondary changes, and we'll see one of the patients who, who presented with a secondary change of chronic sinusitis. Uh, if it's compressing or if it's arising in the supranasal um, part of the orbit, causing compression of the trochlea or the superior of the oblique muscle, there could, could be uh, uh, an uh, extraocular movement disturbance, and uh, there can be a picture of an acquired browns. And really, there are isolated reports of uh, uh, osteoma arising from the spinoid sinus and causing an orbital apex syndrome also. Uh, but these are, again, uh, something which are pretty rare. Uh, what we should be aware of, again, this is something uh, which is uh, possibly good to know, at least from the theory point of view, though uh, practically we, we really get to see uh, osteomas or multiple osteomas in and around the orbit. But it's a good idea if you find a um, single osteoma uh, on, and if there is an associated pigmentation of the fundus, the congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, and if these are atypical chirpies, what we call as the grouped uh, pigmentation, multiple chirpies, or maybe the atypical ones, uh, then uh, there is a possibility that you know we, we should rule out uh, the syndromic association, the Gardner syndrome. We are aware of this syndrome. Uh, this is basically one of the cancer predisposition syndromes where there are multiple intestinal polyposis and uh, the important thing here is that these are the patients who can develop uh, carcinoma of the colon, and it's a familial thing. So at least if what we can do from our, even if you're not doing a systemic workup, if you find a patient of osteoma or diagnose a patient of having osteoma, it's a good idea to have a good look at the fundus and at least rule out any associated fundus pigmentation also. Uh, if two are there together, then of course, a little detailed workup is required. Uh, so for the most bony tumors, uh, imaging are the if going ahead with an excision or a biopsy, then of course histopath sort of corroborates the thing. So osteomas on imaging are pretty well circumscribed. They are they are basically mature bones and they are seen as a radiopaque lesions where the radio density is similar to the rest of the bones of the orbit. And depending on the location uh, of the lesion and the extent. Uh, it could be uh, a smooth, generally a smooth uh, surface lesion, but there can be some oscillation depending upon how extensive the lesion is. But more often than not, we'll see them arising in, in the area of the frontal or the ethmoid sinuses. Um, on histopath, again, what we see are these are mature bones. Uh, so there is, uh, they are pretty well circumscribed lesion, uh, and there are variable amount of cancellous and compact lamellar bones, uh, along with the Havertzian systems, uh, seem pretty well developed. Usually, the outermost zone is presumed to be more durable, and as you see, the inner part of the lesion, uh, there can be some activity of uh, maybe immature bones, also open bones. So, these are again histopath findings, uh, which uh, again good to be aware of it, which might help in differentiating the other lesion if there is any diagnostic uh, dilemma. So, moving on to a few cases. Now, this was a young uh, gentleman. He came to us with chief complaints of the sudden onset of swelling redness in the eye. Uh, 
it was just a day history and as we see here he has periocular inflammation swelling of the eyelids the eye seems congested and uh, um, there is a subtle proptosis with a little downward displacement of the globe all these are findings typical of an orbital cellulitis and he also had restriction of his ocular movements both horizontal as well as vertical which again corroborates the or confirms the diagnosis of an orbital cellulitis now usually the next set of uh, um, diagnostic modality for these patients are in imaging and this is what the imaging show so again the findings are pretty clear it's in the area of the front sinus uh, but uh, what we see in the imaging is also the associated sinusitis. Probably this has caused first obstruction in the drainage of the sinuses and caused an associated sinusitis, which uh, led to a secondary orbital cellulitis. And that's when he actually uh, came for a consult. He was otherwise not aware of this lesion which was sitting there. So this uh, kind of, at, at this presentation, of course, he needs a symptomatic treatment. We need to treat the cellulitis component. And, uh, which is uh, same as any other uh, sort of you know, treatment which is given for any other cellulitis, along with decongestion uh, to open up the drainage of the sinuses. And post-resolution of that episode, we probably can assess him whether there is a need to uh, remove this lesion or debulk this lesion if it is causing recurrent episodes of sinusitis or a cellulitis kind of picture. Otherwise, generally for osteomas, the treatment is conservative. More often than not, there will be incidental finding and if it is symptomatic, like maybe in this patient or causing any other symptoms, or if cosmesis is a concern, then um, uh, surgical excision is the treatment of choice. So another patient, another young gentleman, these are generally the patients, osteomas are usually uh, present or uh, the age group is you know, the younger adults, 20s and 30s maybe. So this again looks like a pretty well-defined mature bone Radio, extremely radio dense, radio opaque lesion, which seems to be again arising from the frontal um, bone here, frontal sinus areas. But this is pretty large. And what we see, his concern mainly was the cosmetic appearance with a gradual uh, sort of, you know, deviation of the eyeball uh, because this lesion was pressing on the eye and causing lateral displacement of the globe. So if cosmesis is a concern, this is one of the indications where we can go ahead. Many times, secondary changes also. So that's another indication where we might have to go for excision or debulking of this lesion. So this lesion was pretty well defined and uh, seems like almost there is a small um, pedicle here. It is not completely pedunculated, but seems to be an area uh, where probably uh, it might be adherent to the bone at any at one point. But generally, these are sort of you know sessile kind of lesions. So. This is just a small video clip, just to uh, show a representative uh, steps of uh, how do you go about excising this lesion. So since this lesion was supranasal in this patient, uh, we can go ahead with a supranasal orbitectomy, transcutaneous, because we want to go via the superiorosteal approach here. So this is similar to any other uh, approach for any other supranasal tumors, like uh, you. Uh, your incision is skin muscle depth, you split orbicularies, and you reach the bone at the superior, the superior orbital rim. You lift up the periosteum, and the lid will be just in the superiosteum. So, once we lift it up, we start seeing the lesion. So, that's where it is. It is in continuation of bone. So, that's your uh, supraorbital neurovascular bundle, and it is just uh, temporal to that. What we have to do is to kind of, you know, uh, dissect it from the uh, remaining uh, of its attachment to the rest of the frontal bone. So if there is a well-defined pedicle, you just have to kind of, you know, drill the pedicle or cut the pedicle. If it is not, if it's a scissor lesion, uh, lesion like this, you can uh, drill and create a plane between the uh, rest of the bone and the lesion. So if the, it's like creating a trench in a fake hole. Like once the trench is of sufficient depth, you can fracture that lesion and then I take out uh, the tumor. Uh, at this step, it's important to avoid any, uh, any important structures which might be around, especially if it's a big lesion and if your drilled edges of the bone are not very smooth. So the remaining bone you can debulk further if required. 
and smoothen it out so that it doesn't cause any erosion or any secondary changes and the rest of the steps are similar to the kind of closure of orbitator. So this was the patient about two weeks post-op and you can see that you know his displacement is much better and cosmetically he seems uh, much better. And this patient generally does not refer back even if you have an income taxation. So one can see that we do for every patient every second required uh, to get a, a adequate cosmetic appearance or reduce the pressure effect uh, sometimes is adequate is enough. So the location can be variable depending on the location. The displacement of the globe can be upward. This was a little unusual location in the inferior orbit, causing a, an upward displacement of the globe. Again, asymptomatic, detected on routine evaluation for another some other condition. And uh, sometimes it can also arise from the ethmoid sinuses. Here again, if a complete excision is not possible, like in this lesion, which is pretty diffuse and extensive, and causing a lateral displacement or temporal displacement of the globe, a partial debulking to just flush the lesion, remove the area which is pressing on the globe and make it, you know, flush with the rest of the medial wall might be sufficient to give a better cosmetic appearance. Now, moving on to the other um, common lesions, primary bone tumors, that is fibrous dysplasia and ossifying fibroma. Uh, these are pretty confusing because they have a lot of overlapping findings on histopathology as well as in uh, sort of, you know, uh, radiology or imaging CT scan also. But mostly the differential remains radiological. Uh, but even saying that sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish between the two. Uh, and there can be features, histopath features of both the things together in a single lesion. And there can be radiological findings also, which sometimes could be overlapping. So we have to take into consideration both the radiology as well as the histopath finding, as well as the clinical history, the age, the onset, and few other parameters while we are trying to um, come into a definitive diagnosis. Uh, talking about fibrous dysplasia, which probably is a little more commoner, uh, what we have to remember that it's actually a developmental abnormality. It's, it's not a tumor per se, but it's a developmental abnormality. It's basically because of the failure of the bone to mature. Uh, so what we have this is primitive immature trabecular bone rather than a mature bone. And there is dysplastic fibrous tissue surrounding those immature bones within the lesion. So since these are a developmental abnormality, they are present early on in life, usually the first or the second decade of life is there, generally unilateral, but it can progressively increase in size and size changes like hemorrhage um, or some uh, really there can be chances of malignant transformation also from fibrous dysplasia giving rise to osteosarcoma, especially in individuals who are predisposed. Uh, uh, they can be monoostotic, meaning that, you know, it's a single lesion or can be poly polyostotic, what we call as uh, polyostotic fibrous dysplasia, where there are lesions in more than one areas. Uh, but usually, even if it is polyostotic, it tends to kind of respect the uh, vertical line means that usually all the lesions are on one side of the body uh, rather than distributed on both the sides. Um, there is a genetic defect associated with this. It might be important to know at least which causes uh, kind of alteration in the downstream pathways which are uh, associated with the uh, with the development of the bone osteoprogenitis cells and that is what leads to the abnormal bone formation and the development of this dysplastic lesion. So depending on the size and the location of the lesion, there can be massive facial deformities. Um, again, the secondary changes like what we see in osteomas like mucosils, optic canal compressions, uh, all can be there depending on the location of the lesion. Now, this is what we are talking about. Uh, when we talk about fibrous dysplasia, the imaging finding is pretty characteristic and that is what helps us in getting into the diagnosis. And now, frontal bone is usually uh, the most common epicenter when you talk about the uh, orbital area, in the surrounding uh, facial area. And uh, CT will usually show a uh, bony uh, expansion of the bone with thinning of the overlying cortex. Like if you see here, the cortex is still there, well defined, but there is kind of thinning and the lesion is within the bone and it is sort of causing expansion of the whole bone. They're pretty well defined border. Sometimes there can be scalloping of the uh, endosteum. Endosteum, basically the inner lining of the cortex of the bone, like we had periosteum on the outer side, we have endosteum on the inner side. So sometimes there can be scalloping of that also. And what is important is that whole lesion gives rise to something what is known as a ground glass appearance. And that is what is uh, considered diagnostic for fibrous dysplasia. So this is what ground glass is. This is a clear glass where you can see through, but if you grind the glass, it becomes a little frosted. 
and this is what we call as ground glass. You must have seen those kind of glasses being used in windows and many other places. So if you see the city of a fibrous dysplasia, this is how it looks like, kind of translucent, opaque, uh, semi -trans semi opaque, translucent kind of appearance, and the lesion is something which might look like a ground glass. Now, again, histopathology is uh, something uh, which, again, has specific features, though there is some overlap with ossifying fibroma, but generally these are the features which are considered more pathognomic of fibrous dysplasia rather than ossifying fibroma. So these are the, the pink areas of the irregular trabeculae of the bones, oven bones, uh, and then interspersed with sort of, you know, uh, what is called as a very bland appearance, uh, fibrous tissue fibroblast in the fibrous uh, matrix. And this bony trabecular almost arranged in the very haphazard sort of shape. They are very irregular shape. And this pattern sometimes is called as the Chinese letters. Like if you see the Chinese alphabets, this sometimes probably can remind you of that pattern. And that is something which is considered uh, characteristic or seen in the uh, fibrous dysplasia histopathology. And the finding which is uh, again more characteristic in the histopath of fibrous dysplasia is the absence of this rimming of this bony trabeculae by the osteoblast. Uh, generally, the bony trabeculae, when the bone is forming, they are rimmed by osteoblast, but here there is absence of this bony rimming. That, that, in again, that is again considered uh, to be present by this dysplasia. Moving on to a few cases, this was a young girl presence with prominence of the cheek area. You can see this fullness of the maxillary area. What she also has is this little pigmentation of the cheek area, which is not associated with, that, with any trauma, but that's the only pigmentation she had. But what she had is a very hard pal palpable mass, which was there in this uh, area, in the maxillary area. And this is what the imaging is showing. Little homogeneous, translucent, uh, sort of, you know, uh, what we have seen, like, you know, um, ground glass kind of appearance, we can say. It looks fairly well defined. There is uh, thinning of the cortex of the bone, but it seems to be well defined. Though this lesion is slightly more bigger um, as compared to the uh, conventional or fibrous dysplasia, uh, but the histopath did uh, confirm the diagnosis of the fibrous dysplasia. Now, uh, so uh, many a times the differential remains other osteoblastic lesion, like sometimes in hyperostatic meningioma can also be a differential of a fibrous dysplasia, uh, but the age group and uh, the progression and other things will help you in uh, uh, kind of you know formulating a differential diagnosis. We spoke about osteoma, metastasis, we'll have lysis of the bone also. And Langerhans cell histocytosis can also be a differential for these lesions, which again, the histopath is going to help in uh, differentiating them. Uh, so again, the treatment depends on uh, the location, size, and the site. Uh, if it's a small lesion not causing any symptoms, has been sitting there for some time, then conservative treatment uh, can be done. But if it is something bigger, like in this um, patient, this of course needs some intervention. Fibrous dysplasia is considered to be one of the risk factors which can develop to osteosarcoma. So generally, radiation treatment is avoided for this lesion because we know radiation can increase the chance of development to osteosarcoma otherwise also. Now, since we are talking about the pigmentation of this lesion, this is one of the syndromes which can be associated with fibrous dysplasia, the mccune albright syndrome. We all have heard about it, which is basically the triadopolyostatic fibrous dysplasia. Precocious puberty, especially in the girls, can be there in the boys also and the cutaneous freckles or the cafeolar spots. Now, these are the cafeolar spots, which generally we tend to see them more common in the neurofibromatosis, and we tend to associate them, associate them with neurofibromatosis more often than any other bone lesion. But maybe next time when you saw a cafeolabic spot like this, it's important to look at the margin also of the these freckles or the cafeolar spots. Now, if you see the margin, which is pretty irregular like this, something like this, uh, which resembles the coastline of the, you know, Maine. It's called the, like the irregular borders, like the state of Maine. This kind of freckles are more associated with the mccune albright, albright syndrome as compared to the FOLS pores, which are seen in neurofibromatosis, which are much more smoother borders, not like, you know, finger-like projections like we see in the other one. Uh, and this is, this appearance is sometimes uh, called as the, you know, the appearance like the coast of California. So just for maybe, you know, some one of the examiners might be interested or might be aware, might ask you. So it's important to be aware of these terms and uh, these analogies. So moving on to the ossifying fibroma, this is 
a uh, little more aggressive lesion as compared to the fibrous dysplasia, maybe not as common. Uh, this is much more expansile, means that this is this can cause occupy or kind of manifest as a mass lesion rather than being a slowly growing incidental finding. It can cause thinning of the cortex and there can be breakthrough with some soft tissue involvement also. So it behaves a little more aggressively uh, than a benign lesion should. And on CT, usually what we see is in well-circumscribed kind of expansile uh, mass lesion, which again has sclerotic margin. And generally, a thin radial lucent sort of band will surrounding the mass lesion. If you see this a, like uh, lesion carefully in the spinoid sinus, there is this expansile mass lesion. But what is also there is a very thin band of radial lucent area, which is surrounding the whole lesion. So again, this has been given as one of the findings, which is more commonly seen in the ossifying fibroma rather than the other bony lesions and might give us a pointer that, you know, we'd be dealing more towards an ossifying fibroma. Eventually, though, sometimes a histopath is required to arrive at a uh, final diagnosis. Uh, but generally, if the lesion is more aggressive, more rapidly growing, more bigger size lesion, more uh, like, you know, there are more erosion of the cortex with extension to the soft tissues, it goes more in favor of an ossifying fibroma rather than a fibrous dysplasia. There are different types. We probably need not remember them, but in the orbit context of the orbit, we might like to remember the juvenile. It's called juvenile because it's seen in the younger age group, but it can be seen in the older patients also. The uh, uh, where there are uh, you know a typical histopath finding uh, some uh, where there are you know ossicles uh, like the ones which can resemble the samoma bodies which are present in the man meningioma, which are basically small areas of the bone which have got calcified. There is uh, you know. The matrix is calcified and this forms small ossicles. And, and there are multiple of them usually in this variant. And this is a more aggressive variant with more rapid course, progressive course, and cause uh, destruction of the surrounding structures. Uh, treatment is radical resection because it's little aggressive growth pattern, growth behavior, and uh, if it goes towards the skull base and towards the you know the CNS, uh, it might be uh, the, uh, the the secondary changes can be much more apparent and the surgery will be much more extensive. So if it's the diagnosis is ossifying fibroma, you might like to be a little more aggressive in your treatment and in your uh, resection also, depending on the location. Go by the external approach, endoscopic, neurosurgical, where, 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 whatever is the location of the lesion. And you would like to uh, excise these lesions completely because there is a tendency of recurrence if you leave behind these lesions. So generally, the inner core of the lesion is more, much more disorganized, mature bones with uh, vascular structures, more hemorrhage, more blood vessels are there. And sometimes these are the lesion which can bleed uh, uh, if it's a uh, you know, large lesion and uh, if you are planning and uh, debulking or complete excision. Meningioma, like any other, like the uh, fibrous dysplasia also, it can be one of the differential diagnoses. Because, but if you see the age group, the meningioma is pretty rare in the pediatric age group. So if you lesion like this, when you feel that radiologically it looks like a meningioma or sometimes the histopath also can be confusing, especially the samoma uh, toid uh, uh, ossicles, which can be there, which can be con confused with the samoma but seen in meningioma. But if you see the age group, it might help us to kind of, you know, differentiate uh, between two. So this is about the more common ones. I think I skipped the osteoblastoma and the osteoplastoma, which are uh, not so common, and move on to the osteogenic sarcomas. Um, so what is important to know in osteogenic sarcoma, especially in the context of the orbit or the periocular area, is that uh, these are again some of the malignant bony tumors, which are not very common when you talk about the orbit. But there are certain predisposing conditions or certain risk factors uh, a risk group of patients, we can say, where they are more prone to develop osteosarcomas. And the most common uh, for us would be uh, post radiation for maybe a retinoblastoma in childhood because the radiation per se predisposes patients to develop secondary bony tumor. And the RB1 mutation is also supposed to be one of the risk factors uh, which can predispose the patients to develop osteogenic sarcoma. So if somebody has germline RB1, uh, bilateral RB with a germline mutation, uh, it's preferable that radiation is avoided because osteogenic sarcomas tend to develop earlier and have a you know shorter latent period, more aggressive in patients uh, who has rece received radiation uh, for other childhood tumors, especially the patients who have germline mutation in the RB1 also. Uh, 
um, fibrous dysplasia, again, we, we spoke about it. It can develop um, also within an area of fibrous dysplasia. Uh, any pre-existing Paget's disease of the bone can also be a risk factor. And rarely there are reports of osteosarcoma arising intraocularly within a thysical eyeball where there has been you know, dystrophic calcification within the eyeball. Um, most commonly, again, ethmoid sinus, if we talk about the context of the orbit and the periorbital area, ethmoid seems to be the more favored location. Generally, a slightly older age group, fourth and fifth decade are the one where they can develop. But again, if it's developing in the con context of a second malignancy in patients who have been irritated in childhood, it can be a little earlier also. So CT again will sh show more of uh, bony lysis, irregular destruction of the bone, and depending on whichever orbital wall is involved. And the tumor can also extend to the surrounding structures as a soft tissue component. Pretty high local recurrence, mainly because complete excision is pretty difficult uh, because of the location of the lesion and uh, because of the ill-defined nature of the lesion. And histopath, we show uh, the anaplastic cells um, in the stoma with variety of histological subtypes, which could be osteochondro or even fibroblastic types. So this was uh, one patient uh, who has this, again, triradiate lesion uh, based on the greater meaning of the sphenoid, where there is a soft tissue component extending to the orbit, into the um, intracranial area, as well as the temporal fossa with a lot of, you know, lysis of the bone. And on histopath, it turned out to be osteosarcoma. So again, the treatment, they're, they're not very chemosensitive tumors. So surgical excision remains the treatment of choice, along with uh, some adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy, depending on the extent of the lesion and the area of involvement. Um, so just a little bit about the other lesions, which are not tumor, uh, but can behave pretty aggressively. And one of them is uh, the aneurysmal bone cyst, like this young child had a history of I think, a trauma with a cricket ball and following that he developed this uh, slowly progressive proctosis over a period of a couple of weeks and displacement of the eyeball and this is what we see on the imaging. A lot of erosion of the bone with soft tissue component and uh, so generally aneurysmal bone cyst, they are, they are not tumor, they are uh, secondary changes generally as a sarcoma, or can develop within other tumors like a uh, osteosarcoma or a, even fibrous dysplasia can have areas of uh, uh, dilatation, a destruction of the bone, cavity formation, cyst formation, which is filled up with blood. And uh, these lesions generally are very rapidly progressive growing lesion, and that's how they behave like an you know uh, malignant tumor. And they will cause, uh, though they are benign lesion, they cause a lot of uh, uh, expansion of the bone, and uh, there can be sometimes a lot of destruction of the surrounding bone also. Usually, children and young adults can be primary or secondary, as we mentioned. And CT is pretty characteristic. Imaging is pretty characteristic. There will be an expansive uh, lucent lesion with very thin wall cavities within the lesion. So it's a sort of you know multi-cystic lesion, uh, like like uh, the appearance which is called as a soap bubble appearance on imaging. And many a times we can see those fluid fluid levels because these are blood filled cysts within the lesion. So it is called an aneurysmal bone cyst because of the you know extensive cavity and the expansive nature of the lesion. And on histopath, uh, what we see are the blood filled cyst with some uh, giant cells, uh, which are there in the wall of the cyst, and some hemosiderin pigmentation, osteoclast can also be there. The treatment is usually curatage and obliteration of that area of the bone, which has developed that cyst. But uh, many a times, because of the very high vascularity, that is uh, something which might be difficult and sometimes might need embolization of some of the cells. And if it is arising in the context of a pr another primary lesion like osteosarcoma or anything else, um, it might need treatment of the primary cause also. So another similar lesion with these subtle differences on uh, histopath uh, is a giant cell repetitive granuloma. But this is one lesion which is more commonly seen in the joint areas where aneurysmal bone cysts are probably more common in the long bones. We talk about uh, general location, not in the context of the orbit. Um, and uh, the cystic spaces, which are pretty typical of the aneurysmal bones, sometimes might not be so apparent in the giant cell reparative granuloma, but what they show are more of multiple giant cells which are present. Though these terminologies sometimes are now used interchangeably, and again, uh, there is some overlap both in the clinical as well as the history. So I will I think skip again the cartilage tumor. These are sometimes things which are not very commonly seen. Uh, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is something which might be um, 
occasionally, you know, once in a while, orbit might be involved. But again, this is if you compare the other with the other orbital tumors, not something very common. And we discussed the radiological finding of uh, chondrosarcomas, where there is small isolated area of, uh, you know, popcorn or yes, or you know, uh, radial uh, ring-like appearance of the lesion on imaging. And mostly, the diagnosis will be on histopath. So this is what we are talking about, where there is a small popcorn sort of areas within the tumor itself. It might be a clue that it could be an uh, chondrosarcoma or a tumor which is based out of uh, the typical, uh, you know, the cartilage-based tumor. So I think this is what uh, we have if we have to talk of the more common ones, not going into too much of details. Uh, otherwise, it's a pretty extensive list. Uh, I'm sure from the textbooks we will get. Uh, more details, uh, but uh, generally, if we see the uh, practically, uh, these are the more common lesions that we tend to see in the clinics. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, such an extensive presentation of not so an easy topic to present, though. Uh, we have a few questions, ma'am, from social media portals. If you may permit, I might just go ahead with those questions for tonight. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, uh, one of the viewers has asked about on the incidence and uh, uh, approach when osteosarcoma is diagnosed in a child who is a known case of retinoblastoma status post EBRT. Okay. See, the treatment um, remains the same like uh, the way you are going to treat any other osteosarcoma. So, first of all, again, um, in the context of retinoblastoma, especially if we are talking about germline Blastoma, which has been irradiated, it's important to keep those patients on follow because this is one tumor which is not going to come in the very early follow up period. The latent period sometimes can be 10 years, and usually it's 10 years and sometimes beyond when it comes. And so a long term follow up is important. And uh, if on follow up, if you find kind of you know a mass lesion which is developing, especially in the area which has been irradiated, um, so this by default osteosarcoma needs to be ruled out especially if it's a bone-based, bony heart sort of lesion. So diagnosis remains uh, either a biopsy, FNC, whichever you prefer, preferably biopsy to confirm the diagnosis, following that a metastatic workup like we do for any other malignant tumors. And based on the extent of the lesion, the further treatment is spread. These are tumors which are not very chemosensitive tumors, though there are multibodal treatment with, uh, you know, doxorubicin, uh, etoposide, uh, and uh, a combination of many other drugs uh, based on whatever oncologist feels is the most suitable protocol can be tried. But these are the tumors which might not respond very well to chemo. So surgical excision remains the treatment of choice depending on the extent of the tumor, if it is excisable, complete excision, and then followed by you know adjuvant chemo is the treatment of choice. Now, whether to give adjuvant radiation further in these patients or not, because we know this is, these are the you know, patients who are predisposed to develop second malignancies and these are already irradiated is again a call which needs to be taken in consultation with the tumor board or your oncologist and the radiation board uh, based on what is the risk benefit ratio. Mom, like uh, what are we supposed to like uh, counsel or instruct the parents? Suppose the child is on a yearly follow up with us and we know that it is a case of a bilateral RB who has received EBRT. So, do we like uh, instruct the parents to be watchful of any possible fullness of the temporal fossa, or uh, what do we um, particularly instruct them to look at and then report any to abnormal uh, finding anything they feel any you know visible or a palpable abnormality uh, in the facial area? It's not only the face because it's not that most of the studies say that okay, the certain chunk develop in the area of the radiation, but if you follow up these patients further. Majority are also going to develop beyond the area of the irradiation. So it's not that only in the you know periorbital peri area they are going to develop. Osteosarcoma can develop otherwise also in the context of a germline mutation in other areas. Also. So it's important to be uh, to make them aware that any uh, sometimes they tend to attribute the parent will tend to attribute any sudden onset swelling to trauma. That's usually the most common sort of you know association. It could be a very trivial trauma, but it's possible that it might come into notice after a trivial trauma. Also. The idea is that if there is any um, swelling, fullness, any tender, painful mass lesion which comes up anywhere in the body, especially in the area of the uh, kind of you know the facial area, it should not be ignored. And a you know immediate consult is something which they should go for. Yes, ma'am. The next question is pertaining to the triradiate lesions. Uh, 
uh, of which one of the examples which which was quoted by you was plasma cytoma. So one of the viewers has asked if uh, we are clinically uh, thinking in terms of a triradiate lesion and we go ahead to the biopsy and then we notice that it is a case of a plasma cytoma, what should be our systemic workup to rule out a multiple myeloma in this case? So plasma cytoma, again, um, would be part of multiple myeloma, as you mentioned. So the full worker protocol that we do for multiple myeloma, including a you know, bone marrow biopsy, a PET CT scan, uh, if possible, otherwise a bone scan, a bone marrow biopsy, and uh, serum protein electrophoresis, uh, urine banjo's protein, and the rest of the skeletal survey, which you will be doing in the bone scan. These are at least the, you know, the must essential worker to run out a multiple myeloma. It's a systemic disease, so if it is there anywhere, a biopsy, bone marrow biopsy, or a bone scan might pick up other might pick up other lesions, which can then be further investigated. But these are the minimum investigation, including an uh, serum protein electrophoresis, which should be done for this patient. And then, how do we uh, follow up this case? How do we coordinate with the hemato oncologist, and uh, what should be our uh, practice pattern? In this case, if it's a multiple myeloma, if on evaluation you find that the patient has systemic involvement also and has multiple myeloma, then of course the whole treatment protocol will be according to the multiple myeloma. Mm -hmm. If it's a localized plasma cytoma, uh, again, this is something uh, it depends on the location of the lesion. If it's a localized area which you feel a complete excision is possible, uh, then that can be tried. But if it's in an area like you know, this this patient who has a sort of you know triliate kind of lesion, which you know that you are not going to be able to excise completely, then the treatment protocol uh, possibly remains in the same line as we treat a multiple myeloma, systemic chemotherapy and other. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the next question was in a patient presenting with unilateral fullness of the uh, periocular area where uh, signs of inflammation can be elicited on our examination, uh, how do we differentiate a case of a TB osteomyelitis versus an intraosseous dermoid with inflammation? So, uh, one clue is the age group. Uh, intraosseous dermoid, sorry, is something which will be present. I mean, it's a developmental anomaly. Again, it is, it will be there since sort of, you know, early childhood, though it might be manifested later on in life. Uh, mostly intraosseous dermoid patients will have a little longish history. There could be periocular fistula, sinuses, draining. Whereas in tuberculosis, the history will be a little shorter. There will be other history. If there are systemic involvement, you will be able to elicit that history in the form of fever, wetless, some history of contact and all. Uh, but the bone destruction that we see and the bone erosion that we see in tubercular osteomyelitis is uh, more of sclerotic changes in the form of, there will be osteomyelitic changes, sequestrum might be there, some lysis of the bone will be there. At the same time, there will be some sclerosis and thickening of the bone also. Whereas in intraosseous dermoid, what you are going to see is more of a cystic component which is there within the bone and then there are kind of, you know, extension or a channel within the bone which might be extending to the surrounding areas also. And so I think by and large, going by the history, the clinical presentation of the patient as well as the imaging, imaging findings, uh, you should be able to arrive at a differential diagnosis. And it's very rare that, you know, you need a biopsy to differentiate a tuberculosis from an intraosseous dermoid. You might be doing biopsy in a tuberculosis to get the diagnosis. But generally, dermoid has a pretty typical appearance on imaging in the form of a cystic lesion with an intraosseous component or a channel within the bone if it's predominantly an intraosseous dermoid. And uh, episodes of inflammation, long-standing history with some sinuses around the periorbital area might give you, especially in a child. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the next question is pertinent to the aneurysmal bone cyst. What all do we assess in cases of aneurysmal bone cyst when the patient pre presents to us? Second is um, if there is a sudden increase in the size of the lesion on evaluation or a follow-up evaluation, how do we go about it? Aneurysmal bones is though they are benign lesions. So again, these are something which are not very common in the periocular area. We don't get to see them very often. It's more uh, probably the author people see those very often, generally in the long bones and all. Uh, but usually the the behavior, the, the lesion is going to behave more like an you know very rapidly progressing sort of a malignant lesion. In fact, that's the reason sometimes the patient comes to you, uh, especially if it's a child, the history will be typical of, you know, there is some trauma and then following that this swelling has developed which has been progressing very rapidly 
that's usually the typical history and generally it is thought, thought that it is something uh, you know you're dealing with a malignant lesion and more often than the diagnosis might be confirmed on biopsy imaging findings though it says it is characteristic in the form that there are multiple free fluid levels multiple cystic spaces within the bone will give you a clue to the diagnosis uh, but many a time these are the findings which might not be there in every patient so you might have to finally kind of resort to a biopsy to get the diagnosis but if you are pre-operative or you are kind of, you know, clinical findings are pretty evident. And if you find it's a very large cyst, rapidly growing with a lot of, uh, you know, vascularity within the lesion, fluid levels, and where you expect a lot of intraoperative bleed and all, it might not be a good idea to get any sort of, you know, NGO, see the vascular pattern, vascularity with the lesion. And sometimes even embolization is required for many of those lesions before you can go for excision. So it's important to kind of, you know, take out the lesion. You can just curate it out, obliterate that space with a bone graft or any other thing where kind of you know so that the collection does not happen again in that case. So that usually should help. Uh, but again, saying that these are the lesions we don't see it very commonly, so you know it's uh, difficult to say what is the long term pattern of uh, recurrence or uh, if you do not do a complete curatage of the lesion and uh, do they behave more aggressively. And if it is in the setting of uh, a secondary aneurysmal bone cyst, which might be a little more commoner in the setting of, say, osteosarcoma, which already the patient has, you are going to treat it the way you are going to treat the primary. Mom, uh, another question is uh, pertaining to the congenital fibrosis of the orbit, where a um, uh, child uh, with uh, no PL presents to us with the parents bringing a lack of ocular motility and a lack of movement of the uh, there is drooping of the lid with absolute tethered lid uh, to the surface and imaging shows an intraocular mass like uh, structure with the features of uh, fibrosis within the orbit so how do we approach this case one and second is uh, uh, to have a definite tissue diagnosis when do we intervene to have a, a biopsy and then prove it on histopathology it looks like a pretty specific question if somebody is uncomfortable taking it like that. So <clears throat> I, I don't know the association between um, congenital fibrosis. <clears throat> if we are talking about congenital or orbital fibrosis and any intraocular mass lesion. So if it's an intraocular mass lesion, you are going to approach the patient like you approach any other intraocular mass lesion, depending on the age group. If it's an age group and you see an intraocular mass, you need to rule out intraocular tumors that you see in children, most commonly retinal blastoma or a medullary epithelium or anything else. Okay? Now, whether those are associated with congenital fibrosis of the orbit, I'm not aware. I need to read up and see. And uh, if somebody has, was whoever has asked the question, if seen a case like that. And if it's an adult, again, you are going to approach it just like the way you approach intra, any other intraocular mass. So if there is a, a mass which is visible, if there is a media is clear and you're able to see the mass, you know what is the diagnosis is. It could be an RB, it could be a melanoma, and then accordingly you treat the patient. Now, having a congenital fibrosis of the uh, orbit, whether it's going to change your treatment, I don't think so it should. You are going to treat the one which are sort of uh, more emergency, more important, and more critical. If, I don't know if I have answered the question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, answering uh, all the questions so patiently. That's all we have for tonight. But before we conclude, I would like to make a small announcement. We meet next on the 17th of January. There is an international masterclass on mesenchymal and histocytic tumors of the orbit by Dr. Beta Smiley. See you all there. Thank you so Thank much. You,